Well, calls for the reform of the financial industry have been sounded far and wide since the Wall Street meltdown in 2008. But how will financial reform prevent another economic bubble if the banks themselves subvert their own internal warning systems? A two-part investigative series called Silencing the Whistleblowers reports that when fraud investigators working with big banks tried to warn their superiors of shady practices, they were not only ignored, but frequently harassed, demoted or even fired. The article looks at the cases of 10 former fraud investigators at seven of the nation's biggest banks and lenders. The article is online at, bigmoney at thebigmoney.com. It was written by Michael Hudson, a journalist and author of the forthcoming book, The Monster, how a gang of predatory lenders and Wall Street bankers fleeced America and spawned a global crisis. He joins us here today. We're also joined by one of the 10 whistleblowers profiled in the article. Ed Parker was the former head of the mortgage fraud investigation at AmeriQuest. He's joining us from Los Angeles, and we welcome you both to Democracy Now! Michael Hudson, Thanks. lay out your investigation. Right. Um, you know, these folks were, were in-house mortgage fraud investigators, so their, by, you know, their job definition was essentially to be whistleblowers, to find fraud and, and, and document it and expose it. Uh, again and again, these folks, you know, say that um, when they did, uh, they were either, either ignored or, or marginalized, or in some cases uh, demoted, fired, uh, harassed, uh, you know, accused of, of uh, embarking on witch hunts. Um, one, uh, one fraud investigator said that um, uh, she was investigating a, a, a Ponzi scheme uh, involving a sort of a fake real estate development in the mountains of North Carolina. And uh, she said that the, uh, uh, she wanted to, to be part of the meeting with the, with the FBI be between her bank, uh, BB&T. Uh, and FBI investigators, and, and she says that, that one of the bank's lawyers told her, well, we don't want you in the, in the meeting, because if they ask you a question, you'll answer it. And in that particular case, I think her name was Amy Stroop. She, uh, Amy Strapp, right. Strapp. Yeah. She actually discovered that the lender uh, in the development uh, or the development uh, a company was actually paying the the loans, the monthly payments of the people that they were supposedly the, arranging the loans for. A lot of buyers, yeah. It was it was it was a pretty clear tip off that that there was a Ponzi scheme, and and eventually uh, five uh, people associated with the development company did plead guilty in in, in, in federal court and and get get prison terms. Um, according to to Amy Strapp's. Uh, uh, lawsuit. Uh, she felt, th though, that that the bank was was really in a damage control mode. Uh, they were concerned that um, not only would would they be uh, on the hook for the 20 million that the bank had lent uh, into the project, but also for some 100 million other. Uh, Hundred million more in loans that other banks had made. So, uh, according to you know, she alleged that uh, that that she was punished for for pushing too hard on the case, and a, a Department of Labor administrative law judge uh, uh, upheld that and uh, and and ruled ruled against the bank and ruled the bank that the bank had had uh, uh, violated the uh, whistleblower provisions of Sarbanes Oxley. And how and how often does that occur? Not very often. Her case is unusual. I mean, one of the problems is is that uh, whistleblowers don't still don't have a lot of protections. Uh, there was a study done in the first three. Uh, Sarbanes Oxley was you know passed in you know in the wake of Enron and some of the other corporate scandals in 2002. Uh, there was an academic study that found that uh, roughly uh, uh, whistleblowers uh, won their cases about five percent of the time uh, inside the Department of, Department of Labor bureaucracy. So. Not, not a very good good record for them. Ed Parker, you're a former fraud investigator at AmeriQuest. Tell us what happened. Well, I was hired by AmeriQuest um, in uh, January of 2003 to come in and develop the fraud investigation unit. Prior to my arrival at AmeriQuest, uh, fraud investigations or allegations of fraud was uh, channeled through the internal control de uh, department, which. Uh, had multiple uh, responsibilities, so they thought they they thought by bringing me in that they could kind of drill down and focus on systemic fraud within the organization. Um, immediately um, after arriving at AmeriQuest, um, my first investigation uh, uncovered uh, systemic fraud in one of our uh, branches in the Michigan area, uh, where. The branch personnel was working in cahoots, uh, collaborating with uh, outside appraisals to boost value to do loans. Um, that ended up uh, 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 
causing a, a, a major investigation where we went into the branch with outside counsel and the head of our HR department, and we interviewed nine of the 16 employees there. And during the course of that interview, we um, we discovered that it was a branch practice to uh, back into the to, it was a branch practice to uh, back into the uh, loan of value, which was to determine uh, to, uh, which was the determinant factor that decided whether the loan was uh, doable or not. Uh, we also discovered that um, at that time, AmeriQuest was doing uh, what we call verbal appraisals, which is kind of unusual for me coming from a paper where the the account executive could uh, fax to the appraiser the desired estimated value that they needed in order to do the loan. Now, what's interesting about that is that 95 percent of the values that were faxed to the appraiser came back uh, exactly. Uh, as the, uh, the exactly as the amount that was indicated by the loan exec, uh, which is kind of uh, which was odd because on the loan application uh, the the borrower is asked what do you think your property is worth, and so when we did our uh, uh, our investigation and looked at the data we saw that there was a high number of uh, loans where verbal appraisals were. Uh, submitted by the loan executives, and they all came back exactly, and that's that's uh, that's untypical. That's not that's not normal. So, that was um, that was one of the fact things that uh, that I discovered early on, and that kind of uh, ended uh, with us closing the branch, and having to uh, bring back in house a lot of loans that uh, we had already sold on secondary through secondary marketing to investors. So the company sustained a, a substantial hit. Uh, because we had to go back and, and repurchase those loans because of our uh, broker indemnification agreements and uh, broker agreements that we had with the investors. Uh, most people have never so. heard of AmeriQuest, but it, it became one of the first big casualties, didn't it, of the whole subprime uh, crisis. Could you talk about how extensive, uh, how big the company was and, and uh, how, uh, how much that particular situation that you uncovered there uh, was replicated throughout the company? Uh, that um, it, it goes back to the the way the business model um, in terms of uh, how they 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 process loans and their whole business model. Uh, we didn't have un, we didn't have central underwriting, so therefore underwriting was basically up to the branch manager and the uh, loan coordinator to package the loan and and send it to. Our central location in Orange County, where the people there basically uh, just were checking boxes to, to make sure all the documents there. So there wasn't any one, there wasn't any uh, what we call prudent underwriting, uh, someone who did debt servicing, which is making sure that the debts were uh, were the debt ratio, uh, the bar qualified according to the debt ratio. Uh, there was no one to look to make sure that the notes and all the other legal documents were in order. Uh, that that permeated the entire company. The company was. Went from when I started in 2006, the company was doing millions, uh, several million dollars a month. That escalated by the time uh, 2005, uh, we were uh, in the billions in terms of our volume. As a matter of fact, uh, AmeriQuest was, uh, 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 we were right around number one between countrywide. We were battling back and forth between who, you know, being number one in the subprime industry. But it was, it was, it was widespread. I mean, there were. Uh, other inducements um, um, uh, we uncovered in our investigations that um, AmeriQuest, the people that they that were hired to work in our branches, uh, came from uh, high commission areas. They were not your typical, uh, quote unquote, traditional loan executives who are people who understood the loan, who understood what debt servicing was, who understood um, that how to qualify a borrower, how to sit down and counsel a borrower whether or not this is a loan that we can do, or whether they should go and come back and pay down so many bills. These were people who were used to high pressure sales, and it was a numbers game. So you do what you needed to do in order to make the loan work. Uh, what we're interested in is in quantity, not quality. And that became an issue for me because my department um, was job was to report on the quality of the loans, at which basically was to talk about uh, fraud as we uncover it. So it was across the spectrum from just uh, the loan, from the way in which we process loans in the branch to the way in which it was processed at the uh, at the uh, loan centers. Uh, Michael Hudson, we only have a minute to go. Right. Can you talk about what most surprised you in this investigation that you did? 